So, open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 3, if you haven't already. We're going to be talking about David's political maneuverings, part 2. Um, and honestly, I don't know how far we'll get through this chapter, so we'll see. Uh, part of the fun of, you just dig into it, and you're like, there's a lot there. Now, I suspect, at least for myself, I don't know about all you, but I suspect that most of us don't know how bad things actually are. Like, we're sharing prayer requests of what's going on. I suspect most of us aren't actually aware of how dangerous things are around us. We have our means of coping when we do know some of that. Sometimes it's ignoring it. Sometimes it's trying to take control. Um, But I think a lot of what we do is we just try and be ignorant of what's out there and how dangerous things are. One man who could not be ignorant because it was his job to know everything, was Dan Coates. Dan Coates was President Trump's director of national intelligence for two and a half years of his presidency. This man's job was to know every single threat to the United States and how to deal with it. And he's actually a really good, biblically-minded Christian man. And World Radio, which is a Christian radio station, or they do podcasts, so some of the things, I highly recommend it. They were interviewing him, and they asked him, how does your faith in God help you cope with the burden of knowing security threats around the world? And this was his response. You have to have a sense of God's sovereignty, or I think you would go bonkers with all that's happening, and with all the threats and the potential things that could happen. You do lie in bed at night thinking, what could go wrong? What could happen that would be a major threat to the United States? And it is a never-ending thought process because dozens and dozens of different things could go wrong and you're in a real difficult situation. So he said, there were times that when under a lot of stress, things needed to be done. And I said, I remember when I took the oath ending with, so help me God, That sort of turned in, so God, please help me. (laughs) Wise words, right? You have to believe in the sovereignty of God, especially when you know what's going on. And the Bible gives us direction. Because if there's one thing that's happening in the life of David's story, I hope you noticed in his life that we get a picture of from an all-knowing perspective is that things go bad over and over again in his life. And there is threat after threat. Uh, here he is, okay? As I said, we're, we're in Second Samuel chapter 3. David is anointed by the prophet of God, supported by the prophet of God, defended by God. He's now the king of Judah, reigning from one of the most important cities in the history of Israel, His rival king is growing weaker and weaker. The Philistines are off ignoring him or afraid of him. David is doing great. And what does God allow to happen in the midst of this time? He allows David to see that he is still very weak. He allows David's kingdom to be threatened and for things to almost completely fall apart. You just go, why does God do that? I don't know if you guys, sometimes even in my own life, I'm like, okay, I've reached this point where things should be better. Things should be good. Things should not have this trouble. And God goes according to 2 Corinthians 1, verse 9. He's, Paul, talking about his own life, said, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 9. The kingdom of God is being built, but David, or sorry, God wants David to know that it's not because of David's military strength that this is going to be accomplished, or his great political wisdom, or his, his uh, maneuverings and strategies. The only reason Israel is going to have a king is because God is going to work in him. And that's the message we need to take out away from this, is that God's sovereignty rules. And when there are problems, it shows us in the end, the only way anything good is accomplished in my life, in your lives, is because of what God is doing. Now, 
Previously, earlier in this chapter, we looked and we saw that David had a lot of successes. But those successes were laying the foundation for his future failure. Chapter Verses 2 through 5 lists all his family and how big his family was getting. And we talked about that this is a physical sense. He's getting stronger. A large family with multiple wives, and he had a wife of another king, uh, who was a wife who was the daughter of a king. He was getting political benefits, and he had to be very wealthy and strong to have so many wives to be able to defend them, and so many children. And this is having lots of children also showed that his future was secure. So this was going to be a great thing. But David was violating God's law about having multiple wives. And that was the seeds of his own destruction. As we see his own children one day turn on him and on each other, bringing his kingdom to near destruction. Now, we also saw not just David's sin, but also Abner's pride lays the foundation for David's future crowning. So while Ishbosheth and the house of Saul is getting weaker and weaker. David's getting stronger, but so is Abner, the general of Ishbosheth. He's growing in strength, and Ishbosheth comes to him and accuses him of sleeping with, Ab- with Saul's concubine, which in those ancient days we talked about was a sneaky way of basically trying to take control of the throne. Very weird society back then. Um, he's accused of this, and his response was anger. Abner got angry, and he admitted all along that he knew David should be king, and that he had been fighting against God's wishes by keeping Ishbosheth in power. He says he's going to turn the kingdom over to him, and verse 11, what was Ishbosheth's response when he said he would turn the kingdom over to David? He was what? Silence. Silence, because he was terrified of this man. The real strength behind the throne was Abner. So, that's the first part. We're going to get into part two now. As we see, more sinful tendencies God uses to set up the future of Israel. Uh, We just see how there is just all kinds of messed up stuff going on in Israel. And yet God is using this. So when we have messed up stuff in our world, we know God is using it. It all comes about because Abner is very pragmatic. Abner is pragmatic. Abner's pragmatism sets up David's position. We'll see Abner's pragmatism is basically, he doesn't even care about who's right. He cares about what's going to work out for him. It all begins after the fallout between Ishbosheth and Abner with Abner sending representatives. Abner sends representatives between him and David to discuss. Verses 12 through 13. Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does this land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And he said, Good. I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face until you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So Abner sends envoys out. Envoys are like ambassadors, representatives of Abner. He's off up here in the northeast. He sends them down all the way following the orange line to Hebron, where they're going to be. Rece- they start working out deals. They can actually discuss with David, represent Abner carefully, because remember, Abner is an enemy. He's not just a enemy. He's the lead general who's been fighting David for at least two years, and he killed one of David's nephews. And last time he tried to go near Hebron, you recall in chapter 2, verse 31, says that David's men struck down 360 of Abner's men. So he doesn't want to go there again. So he sends some messengers. They probably have white flags or the ancient Middle East um, version of that, saying, hey, we're here to just to talk. 
So they start talking, and their first words are chosen so well because they're designed to woo David, right? To make him think. And it's the dangers of questions, right? They ask him, to whom does this land belong? It's a very clever phrase because land to the nation of Israel is very important. In the book of Joshua, land, the word land appears 102 times, constantly referring to God's promised land as they're trying to enter into the promised land. And so this idea of them entering into the promised land to take this land was a fulfillment of a promise given to Abraham, their ancestor, right? Genesis 17, verse 8, God says to Abraham, I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Genesis 17, verse 8. So does Israel have the land right now? Do they? No. Who has the land right now? Ishbosheth? Yep. The Philistines have it. David has it. The Philistines have it. Moab has it. There's some place up here in Syria. Like, is the promise being fulfilled yet? No, but so get, get the sensations like, okay, the land. So the messengers come and they go, hey, David, you, you're, you're the promised king, right? Who does this land belong to? Well, you, of course. And you know what, David? We want to help you make sure you get this land. And so he asks, we're going to help you get this land, make a covenant with our master, Abner. Now, the word covenant is, the phrase there to make a covenant is literally to cut a covenant. It comes from the idea, if you guys recall, the idea where they would take animals and they would cut them in two and separate them out on either sides and then walk between them. And when they made an agreement, it was basically this promise to each other saying, if we go back on our agreement, may we be sliced in two as well. It was a, an idea. Uh, image was very important. It's like a legally binding agreement. So, it, you know, like when you buy a house and you have to sign that large stack of paper and your signature's on it like 50 times, and when you get all the way to the 51st, I'm pretty sure they like pull out another thing and say, okay, now you got to start writing in with your blood too, because this is like that essentially, you're like, what in the world am I signing? A covenant was like that, a solemn agreement or promise. It's being done publicly. Covenants are always done publicly because witnesses would see and say, ah, this is what you promised to do. This is what you promised to do. Now, do so. Usually covenants also are between a king and a lower party. So it's usually, a, hey, king, I will serve you if you do this for me. So, notice in verse uh, 12, it says, Make a covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. Abner's offering his hand or his strength to give something to David. To, to give him, he's like, I'm going to gather all this land and I'm going to bring it to you, David. Or maybe another way, I'm going to make you the king. But a covenant usually has an, a, a two-sided issue here. You're going to think, what might Abner have wanted? Because remember, what was Abner's position under Ishbosheth? General, okay? So, what position might Abner want under David? General. Think about it this way. Notice this phrasing. Abner basically has said that he is the kingmaker for Ishbosheth. He literally made him king. According 
to um, verse chapter two, verse eight, he took Ishbosheth, and verse nine, he made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all Israel. Now he's offering to take Israel and bring it under David. He's basically saying, David, I will make you king, just like I did Ishbosheth, but he still wants authority and power. He wants to retain some of that power. David's response is, yeah, right? He says, verse 13, good, I will make a covenant with you. Now, I argue David's probably going, you know what? There's been a lot of battles so far. Israelite blood has been spilled. Here's a chance through diplomacy where we can bring the nation the way God wants it rather than having to have an ongoing battle between my house and the house of Saul. This is, this is better. Voluntary would just work so much better. But he has a condition or a demand saying, one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. His one condition is Michal, the daughter of Saul. So, Michal, daughter of Saul, who, if you remember, was the first wife of David. In 1 Samuel 19, she helped David escape. And so, Saul, who was pretty ticked at David at that part, decided to give her to another man, um, Palti, the son of Laish, 1 Samuel 25, verse 44. Probably for political reasons. It was a gave, giving him a political advantage somewhere else. And it, it punished David by taking his wife away. So here's a question. Did David want Michal back because he loved her so much and he wanted his wife returned to him? No. I don't think so. See, David was many good things, but um, a family man was not really one of them. You know, his, his lack of love towards his many wives and towards his children is, is well documented throughout these pages. Because, in fact, Michal loved David. 1 Samuel 18.20 says, Saul's daughter Michal loved David. But hold your finger here and go to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. Verse 25. Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hands of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. So what pleased David about that scenario? Yeah. He, he's not like... Do you remember that the crazy thing that happened with, with Jacob when he wanted to work for Rebecca, Rebecca's hand in marriage, and he was tricked, right? Or Rachel, I'm sorry, I said Rebecca, Rachel. Um, and he was tricked, right? And so he actually woke up and he was actually married to her older sister, Leah, right? And then what does he do joyfully for seven more years? Works to marry her. Is that what David's doing here? He's like, I'm going to joyfully fight on all these Philistines to marry this woman? No. He wants to marry into the royal family, being related to the king. And having his wife back now would pave the way for him to have a position as a successor to Saul. David had the right to request his wife. He, he risked his life for her. He had paid the bride price and a hundred more on top of that. So he's kind of positioning himself here. Now, David seems a bit ambitious here. 
Like he's trying to position himself to be able to have the ruling. He's even making a request so that he could be in line with the king. Is it okay for him to reach for the throne? And it's weird because Jesus said, um, Matthew 20, 25 through 26, you know the rulers of the Gentile lorded over them and those who exercise great authority over them, yet it shall not be among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Right? So we have this problem. Like David is, seems like he's trying to get greatness. He's trying to be king. Is that okay? And I would argue, yes. Because Paul says... In 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. If anyone aspires, it means to stretch out for, to try, to want to have. But what is he saying that he should be desiring? A noble work. It's not the position or the power, it's the ability to serve others. Think of this way, David's not working through all the politics and trying to position himself so that he can lord it over Israel. He's doing this so he can fight for God's people and protect them as his king. Right now, he can't go into Israel and defend them from the Philistines because he'd have to fight Israel and the armies of Saul's family. So he wants to serve He won't always do that, as we'll get there. He fails. But God has chosen David. And there's nothing ungodly for him to seek the authority that God has given him. Because true biblical leadership isn't about being an advantage for the leader, but it's a burden to help others. And this is what we can be ambitious about. We can be ambitious about serving and loving others trying to help them, trying to have the ability to bless others. That is a good thing to be ambitious about. See how you can serve. So here David, he's working deals. He's trying to make a plan so that he can be the king God wants him to be, so he can serve the people without more bloodshed. But in the midst of these messy politics, he does a very honorable thing. He goes directly to dealing with Ish-bosheth, the king. Verse 14. Instead of playing this game on the side, he goes directly to Ish-bosheth, the king. Verse 14. Got to go back to 2 Samuel. David sent messengers to Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michal, from whom I paid the bride bridal price the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. He sends his own ambassadors all the way up, back the other way, up to Manaheim, to the king of Israel, and he asks him to give him his wife. He doesn't have to do this, because remember, does Ishbosheth have any real power right now? Nope. He's talking to the ambassadors for Abner. He could just leave this with Abner. But David honors the king by asking him when Abner really could just get the job done. He's kind of right now, Ishbosheth is like a lame duck president who knows whatever he tries to veto, he's going to be overruled by Congress because there's enough. And so basically, he just he can't do anything. But David comes to him, and I say probably a little more than just ask nicely, he demands for him to give him his wife, Michal, because she was, after all, his rightful wife who he had betrothed. And by going to Ishbosheth instead of Abner, he puts the ball in Ishbosheth's court, as it were. And with the daughter 
or he puts them in basically a position that they have to give him this wife. And so, nope, I'll come back to that. Talish, Ishboth, Sheth, and Abner acquit. Basically, they give him what he wants. Verse 15. Ishbosheth sent and took him from her, from her husband Palatiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. And he returned. This basically is them just giving up. They're like, Yep, David, you win. Ishbosheth commands her to be returned from her current husband Paltiel. Or sorry, Leish, who is the son of son of Paltiel, Palti, um, commands him to be returned, which is basically admitting that David is his brother, that he's in line for the throne, that he's connected with Saul's family. But we got to deal with something interesting here, because it calls even the text calls her as having a a husband right now. She says it's her husband, her man. And if you recall, Deuteronomy 24, verse 4 says, her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. So there's a question of, does the Torah forbid David from doing this, from taking his wife back after she's been given to another man? But Deuteronomy 24 is about divorcing a wife, not having his wife taken from him. There were no divorce proceedings. There was no opportunity for David to say, no, I am not unhappy with her. She was just taken. And though... Her new husband, Paltiel, seems to love her a lot more than David ever did. The fact is, David is her rightful husband. Paltiel is crazy. He follows her all the way to Bahram, which is this little city. You can see it on the big one, and then it's that little part where it jots up right near Jerusalem. He follows her all the way, crying, weeping for his wife to be returned until Abner says, go home. And this sounds so like wicked to us, you know, Westerners who, who love the idea of love. But the fact is there was more about legality at those days. It wasn't as much about love as it was about the issue of what was right and wrong and she had wrongly been taken from David, and now she was rightfully being returned. Abner then goes along with this acquittal by going to the elders of Israel. Verse 17, Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about! For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron that all of Israel and all the house of Benjamin thought good to do. So it's interesting. Abner goes to the elders of Israel, all the different tribes, not Judah in the south, but all the tribes of the north. And he talks to the elders. Think of the elders as more like the local state representatives or the city boards. They are the leaders in the individual area. They don't really have the power of the king who centrally controls the military, but they're the wise ones who demand the king in the first place and have a lot of authority and influence. And so he goes to them and appeals and says, you clearly want David to be king. Later, if you go to chapter 5, verse 2, the elders themselves come to David and said, in times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. 
And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So here's where the hypocrisy comes out. You know what this reveals? It wasn't just Abner who knew that Yahweh had said David would be king. Who else knew? All the elders. So why was David not already king? Perhaps it's the same reason that Jesus wasn't followed. In John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43, it said, Many even of the authorities believed in him. They believed in Jesus. They thought he was the Messiah. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. John 12, 42 through 43. Perhaps they feared the house of Saul. They feared Abner's army. They didn't think that maybe David was strong enough or God was strong enough to defend them. And so, though they knew what they should do, they didn't. They held off. And so in verse 18, Abner says, stop waiting. You all want him as king. You know God wants him as king. Let's make him king. And he goes and makes a special appeal to Benjamin, which is right over Judah, as a member of the Benjamite himself, because here, this was the tribe of Saul. Thus, they probably were most resistant to David's charm. Because they're like, ha, oh, our king was killed. He was our family. And it must have gone pretty well because he's able, in verse 19, to go and tell David that all Israel and all the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. Everyone wants to make David king. And so, verse 20, he makes the long trip down to Hebron himself. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and all the men who were with him. So though Abner's coming with a mission of peace, he still has 20 of his best soldiers defending him because he's still the the enemy general. And there's probably some concerns there, perhaps, but instead of treating him like a David, what, uh, instead of treating him like an enemy, what does David do? He makes him a feast. He honors him. He treats him as a guest. And so Abner starts ver- first saying, verse 21, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all your heart desires. Pretty good, right? He kind of asserts his power, though. You notice the power play going on there? He's like, let me go and bring all of Israel to you. Let me use my power and my authority, and I will make you king, just like I made Ishbosheth king. He wants them to have a covenant relationship, to swear loyalty to David, and David would be their defender. And David will reign and have peace achieved. Things seem pretty good, and so David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Meaning, all right, let's do this. Abner had given David the kingdom without any more fighting. This seemed great. Abner's one of those guys who's very much going and acting in his own self-interest. He's pragmatic. He's like, I can't be in power with Ishbosheth, so I'm going to be in power with David. He's kind of like this young man, the preacher, Donald Gray Barnhouse, talked about a little man, a little boy named Willie, who famously was craw- called out onto the ice, this thin ice, you know, during the winter, you know, the famous dangers where people play on the ice and the ice breaks through. So little Willie crawled out, out of the ice to rescue his, his playmate who had fallen through the ice, was down below. Willie crawls out, grabs him, pulls him up. Everyone is gathering around. They're praising him. They're like, that a boy, Willie. This is so great. 
until one lady comes up to him and says, Hey, Willie, my boy, how were you so brave to risk your life to save your friend? And in between heavy breaths, Willie responds, I I had to. He had my skates on. (laughs) Well, praise God he saved the boy, um, even if it was for the wrong reasons, right? In the same way, it's good for us to remember that though we could say David's ambitions were good, David had godly ambition to praise God and to be a servant. Abner did not. He is a dangerous example of someone who does the right thing for the wrong reasons. You get that? Like he's, he's doing, he's making David king, but for the very wrong reasons. And, and in church, we have to be so careful too that we're not going around doing the right things, asking the right questions, saying we're praying for people, you know, giving people hugs, talking to them back, you know, talking the Bible terms, like trying to recite the memory verse or doing all this stuff, whatever it is, the righteous good things that we're supposed to do when really we're only trying to grow our own power or get the praise of others. Instead, we must be like David. I love this quote from John Calvin. He says, Ambition is the most... Um, ambition is the most mortal ambition that can possibly happen to the church of God when everyone wants to advance himself and wants to be seen by others. If we are to have peace and blessing in the church, Christians must be led by those who are servant-hearted and zealous for the good of God's people, even at their own expense. Ambition can be a mortal enemy. Humility, servitude is what builds each other's up. Now, perhaps David was wrong to go along with Abner. Maybe he was just giving in too easily. Um, Maybe things would not have gone well if he had actually gone along and made Abner his general. However, Joab makes sure that never happens. Though, though the situation seems perfect, David is in control, he's working with Abner, things are going to go well, peace is going to be here, until Joab enters the picture. And Joab's anger rises, threatening the setup piece. He comes in and he wants to destroy this. And it starts with Joab rebuking David when he hears what just happened. Verses 22 through 25. Just then the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told Joab, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner the son of Ner came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. The text starts off very interestingly. Verse 22, Behold, So it gets that just then. It's a pretty good image. You can imagine that, just picture the scene. Maybe like a play, right? Like as soon as one character exits stage left, the other character comes in stage right. Like, and it's like that perfect timing. So it's the idea of saying like right away, as soon as one thing happened, the next thing occurred. Joab comes back from a raid. Now remember, David had been doing raids for a while, going down to the south, going to the west, going to the east, going against his enemies. And they had always been very helpful because right now, David has no power to tax. But he's got a lot of soldiers to feed and to pay. And he doesn't have a lot of land to do it either. So what is? how does he come up with this? He conducts raid against Israel's enemies. They take their goods and they give them out to the people. And Ishbosheth, his rival king, is doing the same thing. 
2 Samuel 4, verse 2 said, Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. This is just what they did. This is how they made money. You go out against your enemies, you take their sheep, their crops, and you would give them to your people. And then your people would be able to keep working, living, doing what they did. So Joab has been out serving King David, going on this mission. And he missed a very crucial thing. He comes back, and someone says to him, Hey, Joab, do you know who was just here? Abner. You know Abner, our enemy Abner, who's like the one who is fighting against us? And you know what else? David let him just go. And so Abner responds by rebuking David. He doesn't act like a servant or a general here. He doesn't act like a nephew, but he comes as Lord. And this begins to show, as we'll see at the very end of this chapter, David's not as powerful as we might think. He's not in control. And so he even says, verse 39, Um, These men, the sons of Zeruah, are more severe than I. They are more powerful, as some translations say, than I. And he has to ask the Lord to work in them. Pastor Richard Phillips, writing about this, calls Joab the kind of person who is always a barrier to peace. Because he would not trust Abner no matter what. For a couple different reasons. One, he doesn't think it's possible for a man like Abner to be sincere. Like, he can't can't do this. Verse 25, he says, no, no, he's not telling you the truth. You know he came to deceive you and to spy on you. He's trying to know what's going on. So you let him into our stronghold, David, and he is going to take that information, (coughs) excuse me, and he's going to attack us. But secondly... Do you remember? Does anyone remember what Joab's position was in David's army? What was it, think, Jared? You know? He was the general. And what was Abner's position in Ishbosheth's army? And again, Abner wanted something out of the agreement. So who is that threat here? Joab. Abner could very well supplant him as David's military commander. So, Joab was probably a little bit anxious over this. Wait a second. You, you want to let him into our ranks? He's more experienced. He has the loyalty of the rest of the army. That could be a danger to his position. Or perhaps, most powerfully, He didn't want peace because instead he wanted revenge. Remember what Abner had done. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 18 through 23, the whole section. Azahel pursues Abner, verse 19. And he turned neither to the right nor to the left following Abner. And Abner looked behind him and said, Is that you, Azahel? And he answered, It is I. Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. But Abner again said to Azahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear, so the spear came out his back, and he fell there and died where he was, and all who came to the place where Azahel had fallen and died stood still. During this battle, Azahel, the brother of Joab, was killed. And look back in chapter 3, verse 30. The narrator, describing their motivation, says he had put Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner, because he had put their brother Azahel to death in the battle of Gibeon. Joab hated Abner and could not accept any charitable thoughts against him because he was his enemy, because he wanted revenge. And so, 
We'll get to that part a little more next week. Joab then will assassinate Abner when he deceives him. The peace that could have existed is blown apart because Abner could, or because Joab could not handle forgiving Abner. Pride and vengeance is really easy to come by, isn't it? Anger always seems like the right response to when we're hurt, doesn't it? I don't know about you guys, but there's this big temptation, right? Where someone, someone hurts me, someone hurts my family, and I'm probably not going to actually go out and kill them. I, I, I know better than that, right? I hope you know better than that too. But on the flip side, we might not kill them, but we might treat them like they were dead, Right? Like, you're dead to me. I don't want to see you. I don't want to think about you. If you're walking down near me, I'm going to go the other way. You are as good as dead in my mind. 19th century commentator William Arnott, writing on this, said, Revenge indeed seems often sweet to men, but oh, it is only sugared poison, only sweet and gall. Forgiving love alone does... Forgiving... Forgiving, enduring love alone is sweet and blissful and enjoys peace and the consciousness of God's favor. By forgiving, it gives away and annihilates the injury. As we'll see over the upcoming weeks, Joab's anger almost destroys the unity that Israel had. And we have to learn, too, that our anger... Our hurt, if it is held on to, can destroy the unity of the church. All all it takes is a word about someone else to spread through the church, to slip out, and it can be destroyed. And so that's why Paul in Ephesians 4, 3 calls us to eagerly maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let me finish with just a couple practical tips that Tim Challies gives. Tim Challies, the great blogger, the most famous Christian blogger in the world, as he is often called, not by himself, by others, gives some practical hints for fighting for unity. How can we fight when we're hurt? And he says, one of them, there we go, spend more time considering evidences of grace in other Christians than you do pondering their sins and weaknesses. It's much easier to remember and think of all the negative things. Like, like Joab does. He's like, no, he's a liar. He's a cheater. He's a deceiver. So we can probably most easily see their failings. Oh, they said they would do that once, but they didn't. They're a liar. Oh, no, you know what? I, they just don't, they don't, they don't do this enough. They're not a good Christian. If instead we use our magnifying glass to look for the good things God is doing in them, the graces of God, rather than look for the sins. Puritan David Brooks says, sin is darkness and grace is light. Sin is hell. Grace is heaven. And what madness it is to look more at darkness than at light, more at hell than at heaven. Secondly, meditate on God's many commands demanding that we love one another. You want to fight for unity? Think about how God commands us to love one another. When, when your heart starts to turn against other Christians and you're like, I am angry with them for what they have done. Remember what God tells you to do, to love them. And third, count the cost of disunity. When relationships break down, disagreement follows And every disagreement between Christians is a triumph of Satan. If disunity begins to creep in, we don't want to hand Satan a victory. So maintain peace and deny him the triumph. Or the last one I'm going to look at now. Judge yourself more than you judge others. Think of it this way. If we were to stop and take more time considering our own sin and less time considering the sin of others, 
we probably wouldn't be very quick to judge. We probably wouldn't be very quick to condemn. It's always the thing like, like, I give me the benefit of the doubt, but don't allow that for them. Again, Brooks says, there are no souls in the world that are so fearful to judge others as those that do most judge themselves, nor so careful to make a righteous judgment of men or of things as those that are most careful to judge themselves. We judge ourselves first. Yeah. We'll finish the rest of the chapter next time because I can't get into it. But hear this. God is in control. Even over the craziness. Even over the fact that David is so close. He's in power and it gets ripped away from him again. But we do that by listening to what he says to do. Pursuing peace. Let me pray. Father, we confess and admit we are not in control. That we cannot make things go the way that we want them. And you are gracious and kind to reveal that to us again and again. Oh Lord, reveal to us the fact that we too are sinners. When we are tempted to judge others, may we remember that Lord, you should judge us. May we not be like Abner, Lord, who was pragmatic, did not care about what was right but would only benefit us. May we not be like Joab, who risked the peace of Israel because of his personal vendetta. May we seek to see you increase, Lord, and us decrease, remembering our own sins and the grace you have given us. And so may we give that grace to others. We ask, Lord, you enable us to do this all to the glory of your great name, Jesus Christ. Amen.